And so we believe God has great, great things for you. I'm going to go right into the word if that's okay. I just feel God wanted us to connect right away. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to go ahead and pray. And we'll get started right into the word and some testimonies that, of what the Lord did in the mission field. Let's pray together. Father God, we're so grateful that your word is so rich, so um, beautiful, Lord. We're just so honored. Just like we heard today that your word, we have to meditate in it. We have to hear it. We have to just connect with it. We have to be willing to obey it. So, Lord, we ask today that you would deposit that word into our hearts that it may be good, that it brings a good fruit in every area of our life. And so I ask you tonight, Father, that everyone that's here hearing your gospel may receive a transformational word into their life. And Lord, just like you blessed us in this place, I pray a blessing over the other churches that are around the Inland Empire and around the world. Father God, we believe in them because we believe that you're building your kingdom, not just ours, but your kingdom, and we're building it together with them. So we bless them also as they advance the gospel and teach your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. We all in agreement say, amen, amen. Hey, get your Bibles out. Thank you, sir. Get your Bibles out. We're going to be mainly in one um, book, but I look at a few verses here and there. Um, but we'll be in the uh, book of Luke, chapter 9 and chapter 10. And so we're going to learn a few things. But I want to also share just a few testimonies while you go there. And even myself, when we get ready. Um, you know, whew, about five years ago, we started doing mission trips again here at the church. And, um, you know, our, our young adults and um, and Reverend Beth and some of the young adults that were there, I think it was um, uh, Pastor Joseph, some of them were um, inviting us. Hey, why don't you guys do, uh, uh, Pastor Luke was there, why don't you guys do some mission trips and just do something. So we started going to Mexico and it just kind of the fever caught. And so we got into it and over the few years we've been doing some more missions and some more outreaches. And as you know, if you don't know, the full name of our church is the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. But it wasn't always the full name. Um, God spoke to our founding pastor, Pastor Jim Cooper, about changing the name to World Outreach Center. And it was his desire that as a church, we make a connection, not only in our local area, which we do a lot of missions locally, from our food program, from our bus transportation, from the helps we do, from offerings that we do to other ministries that do things around here. I mean, other ministers receive food from us in order to bless their area. So there's a lot of local things we are doing. Um, our, our house resource center that we have. So there's plenty happening, but we wanted to expand that globally, not only through our missionaries that we support financially through your tithes and offerings, but also physically us going into these places and connecting with them. And that just started sort of a journey that we've been doing for a few years. And I want to um, talk to you about why we do missions. Why in the world does somebody have to either get in a plane, get on the bus? Why do we have to do that? We have so many needs locally. Why do you have to go anywhere? And there's a reason why the Bible says that we do it locally and we do it globally. There's a, there's a biblical principle behind this. It's not just we want to travel. That's not the reason why we do this. We do it because there is a principle in the Bible that leads us for us to do that. And tonight I want to talk about being sent by Jesus. Sent by Jesus. That is an expression that you have to keep in mind and keep in your heart that when we launch into these things, we are sent by Jesus. We're not just making a decision. A couple years ago, um, Pastor Dan and uh, Pastor Luke and a couple asked me, uh, a couple of our leaders here at church asked me to lead our missions department here at the church. And so I took that on. It's been an absolute privilege and honor for the last, what, going on two years now to do that. Um, and just seeing what God is doing through our church. And we, wanna, we want you to know that you're doing something amazing through your church even though you physically are not going necessarily but when you give when you pray these things are happening from missionaries in india that are doing amazing things one of them uh, brought through dr kobernick translating the language into tibetan and reaching people i mean these are things that your church is involved with and you ought to know that in the philippines you hear some testimony about it um in latin america all over latin america our globe uh, goes through dr baron gilfill and obviously through the schools globally so these are things that we're saying god we believe you're doing something amazing we want to be part of it whether physically or financially we're connected because we are sent by Jesus and I want you to have that in mind because that's important I don't know about you but if you were you know a kid at some point and you were sent to do an errand but you know that when you do the errand in order to get what you need you're going to have to be name dropping have you ever have to do that 
If you haven't, it's awesome. Because um, when you go, you know, these people don't know who I am. But when I drop names, all of a sudden doors open. And guess what? When we're sent by Jesus, that is exactly what we're doing. We are Jesus name dropping everywhere we go. We're saying, hey, he sent us. We're going to drop his name. He's going to open doors. He's going to do some great things. And understanding that creates a different mentality because I think people feel a lot of times when they hear the word missions, they see some crazy guy who wants to do this far and all that stuff. And it has nothing to do with that. There are difficult circumstances. There are people doing uh, really difficult things on the mission field. But it's also how the Lord weaves this message to all of us. And I want us to look at three things that missions does when we're sent by Jesus and that our church is connected to and how these things also impact people. And I want to start with two people that went on our first trip of this year in the Mexico trip. And let me make sure I have their names right. I want to ask Karina and Devin to come up and if they wouldn't mind sharing for us and with us kind of what God did with them in Mexico they went I believe in March and so hey would you guys share with us go for it Devin look at this guy how Hello, old are you wait I'm I can't Devin. I can just let you talk this guy's awesome how old are you Devin I'm 11 Ooh, 11 years old and he already went on a mission trip I mean he's on fire go for it buddy um Devin I'm super blessed to be a part of the Mexicali team and my favorite things about the trip was the people and the food the food was super super good they cooked us two giant meals with fresh tortillas and salsa every day. Everybody was super nice, hospitable, and loving. My team members and I made friends with all the neighborhood kids, and we all played soccer together for several hours every day. We also did food distribution, and we went to this one lady's house, and our team leader asked me if I had a word of knowledge, and I had never done that before. But the Lord whispered to me that her heart was hurting. She confirmed that her son was in jail. She started tearing up as we prayed for her son to get out of jail. And I'm very, very thankful that we got to go on this trip because we reached so many people and so many people reached us. Thanks. Awesome. Good job. Hi, my name is Karina. That's my son, Devin. Our whole family went. So we have four kids and my husband's there on the sound, doing sound. And um, it was a really, this was probably the best missions trip I've ever done in my whole life. Um, past, I'm a pastor's kid, and past missions trips that I've done, it was highly detail-oriented, very organized, which is great. But this time, it was like a whole nev nother level with Pastor Steve. He was awesome, and he was just kept reinforcing we're gonna go with whatever the Holy Spirit leads however he leads however he leads so we had a great week of um, fellowshipping with the locals we had seen many many healings and miracles physical healings um, and on the last day we thought we were done we wrapped everything up and we were just kind of chilling and eating our last meal with everyone at church and we thought okay we're gonna go home and that's it but the Lord had another plan and he had yet one more miracle to perform. And it was not a physical healing, but a spiritual healing. Someone had asked us to come bless their house. Um, so Pastor uh, Steve said, you know, hey, somebody wants us to come bless their house. Does anybody want to come? You don't all have to come, whoever feels led. So a group of us decided to go. Some of us stayed behind and played with the kids. And we just thought, oh, we're just going to bless the house, and it'll be happy, and we'll just leave. But again, the Lord had another plan. And when we got there, you could feel that there was a spirit of oppression in that house, and it was kind of a dark, dark room, very small, and it, you just could feel a thickness. And uh, uh, Pastor Steve asked us, okay, does, is, it, is the Lord impressing anything on your hearts? And immediately, the Lord opened my eyes, and I saw... If you've ever been to a Chinese restaurant, there are these cat, um, they're idols, and they always place them in the front of restaurants. And it's got a paw that goes like this, and it beckons you. And that's like a, a cat of good fortune. Well, I, I recognize that, that it's not just a cute thing that they put for decoration in, in Chinese restaurants or nail salons or whatever, but they are actually idols and gods uh, to bring in fortune. So I identified that, and then he explained in, or they explained in Spanish what it was, and and said, "Is it okay? 
we should remove it. And they said, yes, okay. Is there anything else in your house that we should know about? No, 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 that's it. Are you sure? No, that's it. There's nothing else. Okay, would you like to accept Jesus? And she said, I do, but it won't let me. And we were praying, okay, what is, what is this spiritual oppression? Then my husband said, I feel that behind where she was standing, there's like this big um, spiritual presence over her that is keeping her from um, accepting Christ. There was a lot of battle in prayer. And so Pastor Steve said, you know, okay, let's pray. Everybody pray. So we're praying, praying, praying. And she said, I want to, I want to, I said, I want to accept Jesus, but I can't. It won't let me. There were a lot of tears. Her phone kept ringing, a lot of distractions. So it was, there was definitely a battle going on. Finally, after praying, um, the, the chains were broken. So we, we, we praise God for that. And she did accept Christ. And after that, she said, okay, there were more idols. There are. So she opened the curtain behind her, and there was an entire big room uh, with, like, an inset shrine of, like, these big um, angel of death that I've never seen before, these statues, about three feet high and a bunch all around. And we were just like, <gasps> Wow, okay, so this is a whole nother level. And she said she had been praying to these uh, to help her family. Uh, she needed diapers for her babies, and she would pray, pray to these angels of death uh, to provide. So uh, Pastor Steve said, you know, we can't take these away for you. The, the man of the house has to remove it. And so we prayed for him. He accepted Christ too. Hallelujah. Amen. And he... We had him remove it and bring it outside. So here we are bringing out all these like giant, you know, angel of death uh, statues. It was really kind of creepy. And then we had to put it into like one of the guy's cars from church. And he was like, oh, man, I don't want to put it in my car. <laughs> He's like, will you please pray over my car? So Pastor Steve anointed the car, prayed over it, and then they drove it off and the guys demolished it. So praise God for that. Amen. <laughs> What I took away was that God can obviously use anyone. You don't have to be especially eloquent or gifted to go on missions. You just have to have a heart that's willing to obey and, you, and to pray. And God, that's just the first step. He'll do the rest. And the second thing was we found out that she actually, her father was a pastor and she had strayed from the Lord, but he had been praying for her for many wow. years, and we did not know that. So prior to our trip, here we are in another country, and we respond to the call when we go over there. We were actually an answer to her father's prayer for many, many years. Amen. And so you don't know that Sorry. what you're doing, you think, oh, it's not a big deal. But no, you are an answer to a father or a mother's prayer for their child to come back home. Amen. And so... Amen. Amen. Thank you, Marina. That's awesome. Thank you. I'll, yeah, you can go that. Karina and Devin, that's awesome. Man, that leads me to point number one. It's a mandate. It's absolute mandate. And so you may say, I don't feel like going on a mission trip like her. Or I, I don't do, it doesn't matter what you feel. It is actually a mandate to share the gospel. It is not an option. If you call yourself a Christian, at some point you've got to let somebody know about Jesus Christ. It is an absolute principle that is written in the word of God, and we cannot ignore it. And so it's so important for us to have that in our hearts, that this is a mandate. This is something the Lord wants for me. Just like their family responded and went on to this trip because they believed God wanted because the Spirit was seeing them, and they did some amazing things. This is so important for us to understand that it is a mandate. And Jesus tested this mandate. And before the mandate went on to everybody, Jesus layered this mandate in an amazing way. And we're going to see it today how he tested the mandate of going with the gospel before it reached us many many more times it all in mark i believe mark chapter 16 he says go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creatures as a matter of fact the word there is where we get the word ethnicity or ethnos this word means to not 
countries, but preach the gospel to every segment. And this is why it's so important that in Frontier Missions, when we went to South America, we worked not only with Spanish speakers, but actually with tribal. One tribe was the Tikuna tribe, and another was the Kokoma tribe. And so working with these people, because the Bible says ethnies, the Bible says every language, every person should hear what the gospel has to say for them. It is a mandate for us to believe that. And it is a mandate for us to take action upon what Jesus is saying. In the book of Luke, he starts with the disciples. Let's go there. Chapter 9. Chapter 9. It says this, uh, verse 1. Then he called his 12. How many? So he's testing it. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power. What Karina was just saying, gave them power and authority over how many demons? Oh, over all. There is no reason to fear. You just face you over all demons. Gave them power over all demons and to cure diseases. This is something we believe in this church, that God's still in action and power to heal, my friends. And we pray for it and we believe it until we see it. Um, uh, verse 2 says, he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So this is part of it. This is why we invest time into praying for people and believing for healing because God is at work doing amazing things. And then he goes on to say, and then he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staff. That was a stake. Uh, it's not necessarily people, but it's stakes. They take no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money. Do not have two tunics. So don't even take clothes. Just take what you have on you. Whatever house you enter, stay there. And from there, depart. So verse 5, and whoever will not receive you. So, so Jesus is saying, it is not your responsibility to convince people. It is their responsibility to receive the truth that you're saying. Yeah. Do you hear what I just said? I think a lot of people feel, I have to convince them. No, you don't. Just say the truth because the mandate comes from, you are going in the name of Jesus. He is mandating us to go. So my job is to communicate the truth. It is their job to respond to what he's saying. And look, 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 look. And then he says, right here, and then he says, hey, Shake up. If they say no, then shake up the dust of your feet. So literally, see ya. Jesus saying, you don't want to hear it? That's not my problem anymore. I've already said it. It is a mandate from God himself sending us to do this. And the fact that this whole family took on action doing this, that's absolutely awesome. And we got to believe this thing, that God wants this for us. This is so important, guys. I want to share something with you because a lot of people don't understand. I've been involved in missions since I was a teenager, and I love it, and I study, and I read about it because it's such an interesting thing. But the United States of America, it is the number one sending country in the world of missionaries. Number one. So... When people say, you know, the gospel of this and America is this and America is that, the American church is so heavily involved in making sure the gospel gets across the world. And for that, my friends, we have to believe God, praise God, and remain connected because it is our duty to do that. It's our mandate that we communicate and empower others to communicate the gospel because otherwise the gospel will only become something that benefits me. How do I get blessed? How do I get more? And God is saying, if you just go out and give it, I got plenty of more to give you. And that's what he was telling the disciples. Don't take anything. You're going in my command. Go with what you have on. There'll be food for you. There'll be transportation for you. There'll be a house for you. You'll get what you need when you go on your way. And that is a powerful thing because it's a mandate. And when we understand that something changes within our heart. So the mandate went out to everybody, but Jesus tested it with 12. And that is something he wants to do in all of our lives. Here's the second thing God wants to do in our life. And I want you to hear this testimony because it's so powerful for us to connect. I want to invite Eden to share this testimony. I don't know if Eden, uh, if you're here. Yeah, there you are. Oh, quiet. So Eden is the leader of the team that went to the Philippines for the last several years. Um, he's done an absolute amazing job. I love Eden. He's graduated from the Bible College. Loves the Philippines. He's been, uh, made great investments there in the last few years. And so he shared testimony of something that happened to him on this trip. That was absolutely, I mean, all of us want to experience that. But God <laughs> blessed him with it. So would you share what you saw? Amen. Well, thank you, Dr. Paul. Uh, again, uh, my name's Eden. I've had the great privilege of uh, leading our uh, Rock Bible College mission teams to the Philippines. Um, there's two things. Go to Rock Bible College. Woo! <laughs> Plug for the Rock Bible College. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's two things tonight, though, I did want to share. Um, the first thing is, in the Philippines, we actually get to partner up and serve alongside different uh, uh, ministries, different churches, different colleges there. And one of them was uh, we got the great privilege to be serve alongside an international children's minister from Rama. 
And she pulled me aside towards the end of our tours after we were done with our crusades, and she said, I have never seen a team like your team before. And she said, whatever you guys are doing back at The Rock, continue to do what you're doing at The Rock because you're, the team is wearing Jesus so well. So it's an honor back and a compliment to each and every one of you, back to all of you sitting in these seats. Uh, someone else also, a Rama graduate, shared uh, that, uh, and this is to all the instructors, to the Bible college instructors, to all our brothers and sisters that are, have uh, financially supported us and prayed for us. She shared and she said, listen, your team also, I just want to share something, your team is every pastor's dream. <laughs> um, and the reason I'm sharing this is because, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about when one member is honored, then we all rejoice in it. Amen. So it's back to each and every one of you, Rock Church family. Uh, you're so incredible. All the instructors, it's back to you for all, every weekend, they're up here sharing the gospel and teaching us and, and uh, uh, influencing us and, and sharing the preaching of the word to us. So just thank you, amazing, uh, our staff and our pastors here. Um, the one thing that I did want to share that occurred in the Philippines on our very first crusade was um, we do get to share the gospel. We, we, we give them the choice and the challenge the, to accept Christ. And after that, after they accept Christ, we have a healing crusade. And after the healing crusade, they all come up. And there was a lady, I was with an interpreter, and we went to go lay hands on her. Um, and we asked, well, what's wrong? And she was completely blind out of her left eye. I mean, couldn't see anything. So we went, me and the interpreter said, okay, in the name of Jesus, be healed. I had my hand still up there, though, and she ends up hitting my hand. And I thought, oh, Lord, Pastor Dan and the Rock's going to take my ordination away from me. I, <laughs> I, did I hurt her? What did I do? I was kind of freaking out. So I asked Trevor, can you ask her? What's, what's wrong? And she said, I can see something out of my left eye. And I said, oh, in the name of Jesus, come on, interpreter. I said, come on, let's, let's lay hands on her again. Went to go lay hands on her again. In the name of Jesus, be healed. And I kind of had my hand back a little bit further. And she hit my hand again. And the interpreter goes, can you, what's wrong? Is everything okay? She goes, I can see it a little more clear. I said, come on, interpreter. Let's, in the name of Jesus, let's lay hands again. Lay hands on her one last time. I said, in the name of Jesus, we command 2020 vision upon that eye that was blind. So I stepped back a little bit more, about an arm length away. And she hit my hand an arm length away. In the name of Jesus, she was completely blind out of that left eye, and she was healed. Her eye was opened immediately. <laughs> Amen. And the amazing thing that occurs, you know, on these trips, every year, um, like Dr. Poe was saying, when God uses you as a vessel, and when you're available for his use, He's going to do amazing things through you. Okay? Just like Mark chapter 16 shared that, listen, it was the Great Commission. But the final verse in verse 20, it says that he's going to confirm right. the word and accompanying signs and wonders through us. Because we're available for his use. So church, just continue. I mean, we, all these different trips that are occurring... Get signed up. We thank you so much for your prayers and your support. But to actually put your feet and your boots to the dirt on the mission field, it's a whole different experience. And all these different crusades we, we have, we have uh, this year we had 15 crusades we, we held. And we go to the certain virgin territories. We go to certain areas that are in the middle of the jungles walking for who knows. And it's super hot, so like we're just totally burnt, sunburnt, so, but <laughs> we're walking far into these little jungles and areas, but you know, the crusades that take place, that's miraculous, that I take, that I notice every year, is the crusades that take place in the hearts of the American teams that show up, Amen. to put their feet on the ground and being obedient to the king. There's something that occurs when you lay hands on someone, and being used by God that way, Something happens inside you. There's a revival. There's a crusade that takes place in your heart. Amen. So I'm just uh, so blessed. Thank you, Rock Church. We Thank love you. you. Eden. You're awesome, man. God bless you. You can keep the mic. Thank you, sir. Here's point number two. Missions is an opportunity for faith. 
Missions is an opportunity for faith. When we believe that God has planted a mission in our hearts, it begins as an opportunity of faith. If you don't know the story of how the food distribution began in this church, our founding pastor, Pastor Deborah Cobray, amongst other ladies from the church, took beans and rice into downtown San Bernardino, into broken down apartments by themselves in a pickup truck that she had or Pastor Jim had, and they just started with a little bit doing something for faith. Nowadays, we have amazing numbers, hundreds of thousands of people throughout the year, but it all began because somebody took a step into the land to obey God and looking for an opportunity of faith. Missions is an opportunity for faith. Faith to believe in the finances, faith to believe in miracles, faith to believe in coming out of your own comfort. It is faith, my friends. And so unless we understand that, that God is asking us as a mandate that we take an opportunity to believe God that he's going to do something, we will not understand or see God in an amazing way. Let me tell you something. Why this message is so important to me. Um, this is so crazy because I was getting ready to share this message. When I was a teenager, not a teenager, but in my, I was like 19, I led a team with a missions organization that it no longer exists, doesn't matter their name, but I, I led a team and I was on Facebook just browsing on Saturday for a little bit before going to the baseball game and a message comes in and it is a guy that I don't recognize and he says, he says, Hey, man, are you the Paul Gondo from so-and-so team back in 1996? I was like, what in the world? First of all, that's kind of creepy that Facebook people can track you, but that aside, um, it, is so, it is so crazy. And I said, well, tell me. And he, then he started describing himself, and yes. And so this guy kept the letter I gave him in 1996 when, I, when we were both growing up in missions, and he, Loki said, man, you have no idea. I was cleaning out my, my storage. I got married. My wife found this letter. I always remember. You always remember the mission trip and this song we wrote and this thing. And it was such an incredible moment because God wants us to put our faith out there and believe that he's going to do something. But it takes faith, my friend. It takes faith to believe for money. It takes faith to believe that God's going to do something. It takes faith that he's going to take absolutely everything. Are you with me today? I'll continue. So let's go in chapter 10. Chapter 10. Here's, here's what faith about it. Chapter 10. So Jesus tried it with 12, and now Jesus is going to up the ante, and he's going to test 70. How many? 70. So he went from 12 to 70. I tried it with the 12. It worked out. Let me try the 70. So he's going to test them out. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After these things, after these things. So the 12 come back. Jesus teaches them a lot of things. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others so that he had more people following him, not just the 12. 70 others also. And sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. So Jesus sends them and said, I'm going to go visit those places, but I want you guys to go first I'm going to test this out verse number two then he said to them this is powerful the harvest is truly great the harvest truly is great sorry but the laborers are how many few they're few therefore pray pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest go your way go your way and behold behold remember the title of the message I sent who you, I sent you out as lambs among wolves. So Jesus knew what he was doing. Jesus didn't paint it pretty. Jesus didn't say, hey, you're going to sit at the Ritz-Carlton and, you know, pray for a couple of people. He didn't say that. He said, I'm sending you out, and it's going to be ugly at times. So I'm sending you out. Verse 4, carry neither money back, knapsack, nor sandals, or greet no one along the road. So Jesus said, I want you to be focused Focus, 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 totally dependent on me. Focus, don't, don't look at anything else. Verse 5, but whatever house you enter, the same command, first say, peace to this house. So he sent us as agents of peace and saying, you got to have faith when you step out of missions, when you do great things. And look what happens after they come back. This is amazing. Chapter 10, verse 17. Then the 70 return with joy, just like you've seen that testimony and you've seen Ian testimony and many other. Then the 70 return with your saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. That's amazing. The 70 went out and said, We tried it and it works. And it works. My friends, God is asking of us to trust Him and take a leap of faith. And when we do it locally and globally, something happens. And many of us sometimes think, oh, I have to be labeled a missionary for me to do that. No, 
You are already a mission field. In the, my friend's church, they have a sign at the exit. They, it's a smaller church, so it's only one entryway and one exit out of the parking lot. They have a big sign that says, remember, when you leave this parking lot, that's your mission field. When you leave this parking lot, that's your mission field. You don't have to get on a plane, even though we invite you to. You don't have to drive down south or north. When you leave this parking lot, that's your mission field. That's who you're reaching. That's who you're talking. And so you want that. You want to take a step of faith. There's one more thing. Not only Jesus gives us a mandate, not only is it important for us to have faith as we do, this is the third thing that God is going to do with us. And I want to invite Renee. And she was with us as part of the Columbia team. And so I wanted to share her experience because it's so important. Let me just brief you on Renee real quick. I'll be nice. Um, I, I would play with her, but Renee is absolutely awesome. But it was so interesting because it was a hard trip. It was physically hard, physically demanding. And so a few things changed, and we landed at this boat um, at the bottom of a huge hill with 100% humidity. And, um, and we realized that they didn't, sometimes they hire people to help us out carry our suitcase. Well, they didn't. So we had to bring our suitcase. At that point, we realized, man, I should have just packed a small backpack and believe that verse. Just came with sandals, shorts, and whatever I had on me, right? Um, so everybody's looking at a suitcase. And I said, Renee, I'll help you. I was like, Ethan, my son, I said, take the backpack. You take this. I said, I'll carry your bag. And she said, no, Pastor, I want to carry my own bag. I want to do this for me. I want to try this. And I'm going to tell you, it, is, it was so hard. I was at one point thinking, should we just return halfway through this and go back to the hotel? No, no. Uh, but we just said, you know, we're going to do it. And she did it. And I was so proud of her of what the Lord is doing. So come on, tell them what God did with you, Renee. Hi, everyone. I am Renee. And like Pastor Paul said, that trip was very, very, very hard. Um, I had a moment on this trip where I was sure I did not hear the voice of God, right? <laughs> I was sure that he did not call me there, but um, I'm so thankful that he did. Um, before we went on this trip, we had a worship meeting with the team, and during that worship meeting, Pastor Paul had prayed for each of us, and he had said that he got a, a word for each of us. So when he came to me, he said that God is multifaceted, and he wants to reveal himself to you in a new way. I was so excited when I heard that because I felt like that gave me confirmation and it made me very expectant on this trip. I was expecting lives to be transformed, but I didn't realize that the life that would be transformed so greatly would be mine. Um, you see, before I went on this trip, I struggled a lot with the spirit of fear. And I also struggled with comparison because I would see other people's lives and I would feel that at this season in my life, at this age, um, my life should look like that or I should have this or I should be here and not here. <laughs> and so it started um, my prayer, in my prayer life, I had been praying for things every single morning and every single night. And I was like, God, you gave me these desires. Why aren't you bringing them to pass? So when we, met on, when we went on this mission trip, I felt like God kept giving me the opportunity where I could either surrender to fear or I could surrender to him and submit to him. And um, it, it was an amazing trip. And each day... I, we really did have to choose. Like there were snakes, there were bugs. I started having an allergic reaction. I have asthma. I was worried that, you know, I would have a, an asthma attack in the middle of the jungle. <laughs> that would be it, you know. But God told me he didn't call me this far to fail me. He called me to flourish me. So I held on to that word. And each day it got a little bit easier. And I remember one day we went to visit a convalescent home and there was this man named Jose there. And he had, pray, he had needed prayer because he had an ache in his back. And when I was praying for him, God told me, no, stop, the ache is not in his back, it's in his heart. He has children who don't visit him and he's lonely. And it was so specific and I had never had that in my life where I heard God so clearly that when he told me to say that to him, I told him no. And because I, did, I was fearing how he would receive me, I was fearing failing. And I continued to pray for about another minute and then I had just stopped. And I said, Jose, 
this is weird, <laughs> and my translator was looking at me, my friend Kimberly, and um, she translated for me, and she said, you know, Jose, are you lonely? Does your heart hurt? Do you have children who don't visit you? And he immediately started crying, and then the translator started crying, and I started crying. So we were able to pray for him. And then when we were leaving, he gave me a word, and he said, it doesn't matter that you don't speak my language. God is going to use you on this trip. So when I walked away, I remember thinking, thank you, Lord, that you put it so strongly on my heart. And I remember thinking, God, I don't want my disobedience to block somebody else's blessing. So whatever I need to do to be obedient to you, if I look like a fool, if I look crazy, I'm going to do it. And each day that went forward, God just kept putting these, me in these positions. And I was able to give people three words. And it was so amazing to see that God loves them so much that they would send a socially awkward girl from California all the way to Colombia to tell them how much he loves them. And with that, I felt like not only did that fear start to fall off of me, but um, my prayers began to change. These things that I was praying for every single day, um, they weren't important to me anymore. And I felt like God was showing me this is what's important. Doing my will in my way is what's important. These things that you think you should have, I never called you to have them. I called you to be my servant. And so on the last day of the trip, we had gone to this mountain overlooking Bogota, where I felt like I had this moment with God where he was like, you did it. You stepped out and you were obedient to me. And I had to repent to him and tell him, God, I am so sorry for holding myself back from all that you have for me. These things that I was praying for, these desires that I had, they're nothing compared to what you did on this trip. And I felt like he told me not to spend too much time on it and that he was just proud of me. And when we got back into the bus, I had a moment with him by myself where I just said, God, your will, your way, if my life doesn't look like them, if I don't look like them, if I don't act like them, I don't care. I just wanna do what you want me to do. And I heard God so clearly say, oh, how I've missed you. And I was like, the God of heaven and earth misses me? That's wild to me. And so, I feel like if I didn't go on this trip, I wouldn't have this level of intimacy with God that I have now. I wouldn't have this, this relationship where I just feel so close to him and it's just so crazy to me and I'm just so thankful that I had the opportunity to go and I'm just so thankful pa for Pastor Dan and Pastor Jessica for um, them being a church that loves missions, that encourages to send us out. I'm thankful for Pastor Paul and everything that he does and I just think it's so crazy that God just wants to use us, and sometimes we're the ones blocking ourselves. And it doesn't have to be, you know, on the mission field, like Pastor Paul had just said. It could be in the grocery store, just telling somebody how much God loves them. It could be your neighbor, you know. It could be your coworker. And I, I, God is just so good, and that's all. <laughs> awesome, Renee. Thank you. You can take it. Way to go, Renee. This is my last point. Missions... It's an opportunity for God to work in you. Missions is an opportunity for God to work in you. I've always shared when it comes to missions, God does more in you than he's wanting to do through you, even though he'll do great things through you. But there's something that happens in the heart of people, and I see it proven right here in the word of God. As a matter of fact, it's an amazing story. You can read it later and research it, but I believe that he's the writer also of the book of Mark. But John Mark, um, many historians apply the book of Mark to him, but John Mark was a guy who was a missionary, and at one point he was traveling with the Apostle Paul, and something happened, the Bible doesn't say, but John Mark bailed out. Maybe the mission trip got too hard, the mosquitoes were too mean, the food was too bad, there weren't some good tortillas like Devin had, none of that, you know. Um, but at some point, John Mark said, I'm out, Paul, bye-bye. And um, it was such a big argument because Barnabas, who discipled Paul, wanted to bring John Mark. I believe the book of Colossians mentions that he was his cousin or something like that. Um, and so, so Paul said, no, Barnabas, you're not bringing that dude. That guy bailed on me. Forget you. Mark, uh, Paul was really intense when he came to missions. And it was so bad. That, but what the Bible says that Barnabas left Paul and went on to find John Mark. Now, this is amazing because 
Transformation happens and God wants to use people that are at different levels in different ways because eventually later we see Paul petitioning Timothy to bring John Mark and saying, he is of use to me, bring him with you. And something happened within those years where Paul's heart changed and John Mark's heart changed. Something happened as they worked, they did the work of Jesus and they stayed together in a relationship because God wants to work in us as long as we're doing his work. Are you with me today? And here's what happens. Here's what happened. Look what the word of God says in the book of John. Book of Luke chapter uh, 10, verse 19. The 70s go out. They come back. They're saying, man, demons are fleeing in the name of Jesus. We're doing amazing things. Here's, here's, here's Jesus. Verse 19, look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. That is why we don't operate in a spirit of fear, my friends. We have power over anything the enemy can throw at you. Absolutely anything. Uh, it says you can walk among snakes. Don't try that, but the Bible does say you can. Um, and the scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. Nothing will injure you. Verse 20. Verse 20. Look at this. But don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. Here's what Jesus is saying. I'm glad you're doing miracles, but I want you to know that I'm more interested in your soul. I'm more interested that you make it to heaven where I have a place for you. And that is the heart of missions is to get as many people. That's why we're committed to the altar call, whether 1, 10, 50, however many. We're going to do it because God is saying, I'm more interested in people getting their names signed up upstairs. That's my heart and my desire. So what, what should we respond as a church? What should you do? What should I do? The Bible gives us two options that we should do tonight. I don't have them on the screen, but you can write them down. Here's option number one that you should do and we should all do as a church. Ask. Ask. Ask God to give you a mission. Ask God to send you a mission. Ask God for the mission. Ask God for the nations. Ask God for the people around you. Ask God to reach people. The book of Psalms chapter 2 verse 8 uh, says the following in a different version. says, ask me for the nations. In every nation. How many nations? Every nation on the earth will belong to you. Will belong to you. And he's saying just ask. And that word nations really means tongue or a form of communication language. That's why we have a Spanish ministry here. That's why we believe in other languages being touched. Because every person in their language should hear the gospel one way or another. And the Lord is saying, why don't you ask me? And so we've asked. Pastor Jim asked. Pastor Dan asked. We're currently asking and saying, Lord, keep giving us the opportunity to reach as many nations as we can. As many people as we can. As many languages as we can. Here's number two. Go. Go, whether it's in your job, the person in the supermarket, a different country, just go. Be the answer to your prayer. You be the answer to your prayer. Isaiah 6, 8, very famous verse. Isaiah's praying, has a vision from the Lord, and has a communication with the Lord. And says, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send and who will go for us? So here's God. God are you kidding me? God asking, God is asking who am I going to send? Who's available? Who's going to do this? And Isaiah realizes, man, this stuff is serious. And look what he says. He says, Lord, here I am. Send me. Here I am. Send me. I wonder how many of us can answer to the Lord in that way. Just say, Lord, here I am. Send me. You want me to talk to my neighbor? Here I am. Send me. If you're praying for the person at the grocery store and the Lord says, it's your turn. Just tell him, Lord, here I am. Send me. I'm going to do it. I'm going to step out and do it in faith. This is so important, my friends, because this is something that is at the heart and at the center of God. And as a church, the Rock Church and World Outreach Centers, is at the center of what we do as a church. And we're going to believe God and we're going to go and do it because God is sending us. You and I are sent by Jesus to do something amazing everywhere we go and in every area we touch. If God spoke to you, give him a hand because he deserves it. So let's ask, can we spend a moment praying real quick right there where you're at? Father God, I'm just asking with the church right now, go ahead and lift whatever it may be, whatever. If God puts a nation in your heart, if God puts a prayer, go ahead and lift them. Father God, I'm asking right now, we're going to believe and I'll pray in your word, Lord, that you have called this church to be involved in missions to do great things. And Father, we're asking today, we're asking first of all for the nations around us here in San Bernardino. I believe some 10 plus nations are represented in different language in our county. So we're asking for them right now, Father God, by the power of the name of Jesus, that you touch them, that you reach them, that 
somebody reaches, that we reach, give us the opportunity, Father. And we ask for missions globally, for those who are there serving on the field, for those who can't go. Father, since we have the finances, we will send them and support them as we pray for them, Father. And so we believe that. And secondly, Lord, we're going to go. We're going to be obedient wherever we're at because when we leave the parking lot this day, that'll be our mission field beginning today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God is so good. Give him a hand tonight. I want to make sure if you would.